A uh, father and son were at the zoo, and as they were checking out the animals, they came across the tigers. And the dad was telling his son how vicious and ferocious the tigers were, and, and you know, make sure you stay away from them. And uh, the little kid looked up at his dad and said, Daddy, if the tigers get out and, and they eat you up, and the dad is kind of anticipating, you know, having to comfort his son for if, if something like this happened, the kid said, Daddy, if the tigers get out and eat you up, which bus would I take home? <laughs> and that's what happens with the dads. Not that I miss you, but um, can I have some money, by the way? Uh, we're in a series called Real Church. And uh, Real Church, it's not about buildings like we talked about last week. You know, there's not the, the right building or type of building to have a church in. The, a real church is, is a gathering of people who are followers of Jesus. A real church is not identified by the building. Something else a real church is not identified with is, is the type of clothes that they wear. We, if you grew up in the church, you probably have a picture in your head of what church clothes are. Uh, if you grew up in a different type of church, maybe the, the clergy wore clothes like this. Um, you know, that, that's an option. <laughs> Apparently, I messed up the dress code and didn't wear that today. Um, the, those type of clothes started around 300 AD. So about 300 years after the church started, then the, the, the priest, the minister started wearing stuff like that. Uh, for the average person in the church, they just typically wore whatever clothes they wore during the week because until the Industrial Revolution, people probably didn't have a whole lot of changes of clothes, probably one or two, maybe three different outfits as a whole. So they didn't have church clothes, it was just whatever clothes they had. It wasn't until the Industrial Revolution that people started wearing a lot of different types of clothes. It wasn't until the mid-1800s that the whole idea of dressing up for church really started to become fashionable. And so that was, uh, you know, 1,800 years after the church started. Because a real church is not, we have a dress code, okay? The, the fact that you're wearing clothes this morning, you're up to the dress code, all right? So we appreciate that. The real church is made of people who come to gather to worship God. That's why we're here, because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's what it means to be a real church. And as we're going to see today, a real church is made up of people who are dedicated to that task of worshiping God. And so if you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2. If you don't, there should be a, one in the chairs in front of you. It's page 772. Acts is kind of toward the end of the Bible, after the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then the book of Acts. What's happening here is it's the Feast of Pentecost. So it's 50 days after Jesus was killed. Uh, he rose from the dead, and now uh, 50 days later after um, that, uh, Jerusalem is filled for another festival. There's this festival of, of a harvest time. And so there are hundreds of thousands of Jewish people there. It, Jerusalem is just packed with people. And there are people from all over the world. And that is when then Jesus told his followers, hey, wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. Well, the Holy Spirit came on the followers of Jesus. And so they get up and they start preaching. Preaching to these huge crowds of people. And Peter preaches the first sermon about Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2 contains a big part of that. And what we're going to see is this. Uh, the first thing that we need to understand to be dedicated to God is that we need to acknowledge our sin. Acts chapter 2, uh, start reading verse 22. Peter's preaching to the people and says, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Jump down to verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter's preaching and says, Man, you guys sinned. Okay, not just, you just didn't do a baby little sin. You killed God's son. In the ranky of sins, that's kind of like at the top. You all messed up. And as he's preaching to them and 
talking to him about their sinfulness. It says that they were cut to the heart. The word merit means they, they were pierced. Uh, they were greatly troubled. They were convicted of their sin. They understood what they were. They acknowledged their sins. Now, many of us, we're good at hiding our sins. You know what? I'm one of those, okay? Spoiler alert, I'm a pastor and I sin. Now, that may freak some of you out and some of you may not be able to handle that emotionally, but it's true. Um, not only do I sin, I'm pretty good at hiding it. You know, I can dress it up, I can make excuses, I can bury it somewhere. That's one of the things I've been working on in my life recently is being honest with myself about me. Now, I don't know about you. Probably you're pretty decent in hiding your sins too. You know, if, if we asked you the question, you know, are you a sinner? Probably most of us would say, yeah, I'm probably a sinner, but honestly, not really that bad. I haven't killed a lot of people recently and, and you know, I haven't done a, a whole lot of just really awful stuff that you see in those horror movies on TV. And so I, I think I'm pretty decent. And if you have that attitude, you're pretty good at hiding your sins as well. You may be fooling yourself, but I'll tell you what, the other people around you, those closest to you, they know. They know, and just because you think you're getting away with it, the people around you, they've got a pretty good concept. It's kind of like the two grade school kids, the first graders, they just got out of Sunday school class, and they're talking as they walk down the hallway, and one of them says to the other, do you really believe all that stuff about the devil? And the other one says, nah, I think it's kind of like Santa Claus. It's really your dad. <laughs> God knows your sin. Those closest to you, they know your sins. And, and you know what? If we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we're sinful too. I mean, if you check out the recovery programs that are out there, you know, that's kind of one of the very basic steps that they start with is admitting that you have a problem. And that's true not just with, with addiction type things. It's, it's true spiritually as well. Admit that you have a problem. When you hear a sermon or you read a passage of scripture or, or you, you, you see something on TV, you know what? Admit that you've got the problem. Hebrews chapter 3, uh, verse 15, kind of warns us about that. Uh, it says this, Today, if you hear his voice, if you hear God's voice, do not harden your hearts. If you, if you hear God's voice talking to you through something that's in the sermon or the scripture or a conversation you have with someone... Stop hiding it. Stop glossing over. Stop making excuses. Just, just admit the sinfulness in your life. Because here's the cool thing. God knows your sin. He made you. He understands. He knows your sins. And you know what? Despite all those things, he still loves you. He still loves you. He's still proud to call you his kid. And when you can acknowledge your sin and see that, you know what? Being dedicated to God means that you're willing to acknowledge your sin and then you also accept the solution that God has put out there. God knows that you're a sinner and he took care of it, but you have to accept the solution that's there. There in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we kind of see what happened. The people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said, brothers, what shall we do? What do we do? What do we fix? I, I admit I've, I've got this sin thing. What do I do next? Well, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You need to accept the solution that God has put out there. Stop trying to cover your sins. Take God's solution. When we have a problem in our life, we tend to do something about it. If you're in your car and you hit the brakes and you, you feel the grinding of metal on metal you tend to take it to the mechanic. If you go home today and your house is like 90 degrees and you turn the air on, it's running and hot air's blowing, you call the AC guy because there's a problem. If, if, you, if you have some type of a health issue, at some point you go to the doctor. If you have a spiritual issue, what do you do? You need to do God's solution. So that's what these people did. They acknowledged that they were sinners and said, okay, Peter, what do we do? And Peter's reply was this, well, okay, you've acknowledged your sin, you believe in Jesus. Next thing, you need to repent. Repent means to have a change of heart. It, it means going from a self-centered life 
to a God-centered life. Instead of everything being about me, I want it to be everything about God. It's turning and, and trying to focus all of my life on him. There was a preacher in South Africa doing a revival. At the end of his sermon, a, a man came forward and accepted Christ as his savior. And, and the next morning, the man who accepted Christ went to a friend's house, knocked on the door and said, um, this watch, do you recognize this watch? And the man said, well, yeah, it's got my initials on it. I lost it a long time ago. Where'd you find it? And the first guy said, I stole it. I stole it from you about eight years ago. But last night, I accepted Christ as my Savior, and I knew I had to do something. I had to, I had to get this right. And I came by last night, but you're already asleep. And so I came by first thing this morning and said, you know what? I'm sorry. You know, that's repentance. It's changing from the self-centered life to the God-centered life. It's saying, you know what? I'm turning my life over to God. I'm going to let him be in charge of my actions and my attitudes. It's, that's what repentance is. So when the people said, okay, what do we do? Peter said, well, repent and then be baptized. Now, the word baptism just means to be dunked. And so if you've ever eaten Oreos the correct way, you know what it means to immerse something. You dip those things in milk, right? Okay, you dunk them in the milk. That's what the word means. Now, for the Jewish people... They had been baptizing people for a long time. If you wanted to convert to Judaism, baptism was a part of that. Remember when John the Baptist was preaching? He, he commanded people to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. He was a baptism of repentance. Uh, the, in the Qumran commu community, when I was in Israel a number of years ago, there was this group that met out in the desert, and they did baptisms. That's one of their baptistries right there. So you just kind of walk down into the water, and you'd be baptized. Okay? For the Jewish people, baptism was nothing new. But after the resurrection of Jesus, the significance of baptism changed. And a couple things were added. First of all, you're baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. Because it's through him that we get to heaven. And second, you'd be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God living inside of you. Now, as you walk through this process, these people, first of all, they acknowledged that they had a sin and they were willing to repent uh, and then they were willing to be baptized. You see what happens along the way? They made the choice to acknowledge their sin. They made the choice to repent and they made the choice to get baptized. Now, some of you were baptized by your parents. You know, when you were born, uh, took you to the priest or, or the minister, and, and he sprinkled some water on you. And you know what? That, that's a great thing. I'm glad your, your family did that. But just like in, in the rest of this process, you have to make a decision on your own. You have to make a choice to be baptized because you choose it, not because someone else did. If you were, were sprinkled as an infant, that's really cool. But let me ask you, what decision-making process did you go through to make that happen? Well, you probably didn't. What decision-making process as an infant did you, did you go through to repent of your sins? Well, you didn't. That's why at some point, as grateful as we are for our parents' faith, we have to make a faith choice of our own. And, and part of that is, is turning our lives over to Christ, being baptized into him. Romans 6.4 gives us a picture of what that looks like. Romans 6.4 says, We were therefore buried with him, with Jesus, through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so what you do when you're baptized is you're making a choice. And the choice is this. Up to this point in my life, I've run my life like I wanted to. And when I sign this dotted line, when I go get, get baptized, what I'm saying is I'm dying to my old self and I'm giving God control. It's like if you have a blank contract and you just sign your name at the bottom, God will fill the details in later. That's what you're signing up for. God, I give you control. And so you, you die to your old self. And the Bible says when you come up, you, you rise again to a new life in Christ. And it's a, it's a life where he is in control and not you. It's a kind of a cool thing when you think about it. Because you've been running your life to, to this point, and you would probably admit things are not going so well. And so it's kind of like you get an upgrade. You know, now it's, it's uh, Henry 2.0 or Georgina 3.6, whatever it is. It's, it's a new life. 
You know, you can try to cover up your past. You can try and stay busy. You can try and distract yourself, but that emptiness is still there. At some point, you need to be reconciled with God. You know, there's a story about uh, a a town in Spain where there's a father and son who become estranged. They're fighting, and the son just couldn't take it anymore, and so the, the son ran away. And so the father went throughout the entire town looking for him and in search for his son for months. And finally, just as a, as a last, ditch, last ditch effort, he took out an ad in the newspaper. And the ad in the newspaper, it said this, Dear Paco, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday, 800 Pacos showed up. Because they were all looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. You know, our Heavenly Father has done the same thing. He has put out the message. He has paid the price. He wants to be in a relationship with us. He has put it out there. And all that's left is for us to accept the message. For us to accept the, the offer that he's given us. To, to do it the way he set it up. We need to acknowledge our sins. We need to accept the solution God has given us, and then we need to act on what we know. We need to act on what we know. There in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, uh, Peter told the people, okay, here's what you do. And so those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. People responded to the message. You know what? They could have done this. At the end of his sermon, they could have gone up to Peter and said, Peter, great message, best gospel message I've ever heard. It's also the only one they'd ever heard about Jesus, so there you go. Uh, They could have gone to lunch afterward, and they could have talked about the stuff in Peter's sermon. and said, oh, it's a great sermon, absolutely. Instead, they did something about the sermon. 3,000 people got up and were baptized. Now, I don't know what that looked like, but it had to have been something kind of cool. Just to go down to the river and and to see 3,000 people lined up, that's a big deal. Not just that it was 3,000 people, as cool as that is, but they were signing up for a changed life. And for these Jewish people, it was a changed life because they were going against their family. When they made that choice to follow Jesus, they were going against their family. And there was a lot of breakup in families when they made that choice. The Jewish people that made this decision were going against thousands of years of tradition Because they're worshiping this guy who came along and said that he was God in the flesh. For Jewish people, I mean, they they wouldn't even pronounce God's name, let alone say, this is the guy, that he's God here. They were going against their religious upbringing to follow Jesus Christ. God has promised us a new life. And the new life is is, kind of weird in some ways. It's a, it's a life where we, we believe in someone that we can't see. It's a life where we say that, that we trust that God is going to work in us, that we believe that God is going to work in our situations, that God is not going to save us from all of our problems, but ultimately he's going to work through them. That's the contract that we signed with God, that we're going to trust him for those things. And if you've already accepted Christ as your Savior, what difference is it making in your life? If you've already accepted Christ, have you given up any sinful habits? If you've already accepted Christ, have you had a change of priorities in your life? Are you actively promoting God's kingdom at the place that you work? If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, are you still focused on this life? Or are you investing in heavenly things? See, because ultimately, we're supposed to live a faith where we live it out in our daily life. It's not just a mental faith. It's one that we live out. James 1.22 says it like this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. I think it's really interesting how he puts that. Don't just listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. I think it's really easy for us to deceive ourselves when we hear a sermon. Because we'll listen to a sermon and go, man, that that was a great sermon. I agree with the things that were in that sermon. And we go, man, okay, I'm good. And so we've deceived ourselves. Because we think that just because we understood it and we agreed with it, 
that we're doing it. That's why James says, don't deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You know, it's kind of like General uh, Stonewall Jackson during the Civil War. His army came up to this river and they had to get across the river. And so he went to the engineers and said, hey, I, I need you guys to build a bridge so we can get across the river. And then he went to the wagon master and told him the same thing. The wagon master was in charge of all the supplies, all the wagons full of food and ammo and all those things. He told the, the wagon master, hey, we need to get the wagon train across the river as soon as we can. So the wagon master said, all right. He went and gathered all the wood and stones and fence posts and all the stuff he did, and he built a bridge. And before daylight of the next day, he went to General Jackson and said, hey, the, all the supplies are across, the, the artillery is across, everything's across. And General Jackson said, well, where are the engineers? What are they doing? And the wagon master said, well, they're in one of the tents. They're drawing up plans for a bridge. You know, I think that that, that kind of is what happens with us sometimes. We, we hear a message, maybe it's here in church, or we read something or in the Bible or something online about God, or we have a conversation and we draw up some really cool plans about serving God, but we never actually get around to the serving of God. We never get around to acting on the, the stuff that we know. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time at all, you know stuff. You know, you may not know everything there is to know about following God, but you need to act on what you know right now. Let the future take care of the future, but God has given you some types of instructions for now. Why don't you be obedient in doing that, and then we'll figure out what to do in the future. Acting on what we know, being dedicated to God, being a, being a real church means we're dedicated to God. It means that we acknowledge our sin and that we can't get to heaven on our own, and so we accept the solution that God gave, Jesus Christ. And after we do that, we act on the information that we know, and the more that we know, the more that we have to act on, and, and we spend the rest of our lives acting on the stuff that, that we're supposed to know and the stuff that we learn. That's what it means to be a real church. That's what God has called us to be, and that's what we're trying to live out. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to be perfect for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that your focus is going to get off of God sometimes. That, you know, th those things are going to happen. But every time we realize that, we acknowledge that, and we go to God and say, okay, God, I'm sorry, and we start directing our focus back onto him and living the way he wants us to. You know, there was a, uh, a man, his name was uh, Charles Adams. In the 1800s, he was a political figure and a diplomat. He kept a diary. One day in his diary, he, he wrote this. He said, went fishing with my son today, a day wasted. His son kept a diary, and his son kept a diary on that day, and, and it said, went fishing with my father today, the most wonderful day of my life. The dad thought he was wasting his day because nothing was productive that day. But he missed out on the fact that it was the most incredible day for his son because his son got to spend time with his dad. And I think that we look at that sometimes and go, man, I can't believe the dad would have that type of an attitude. But I think... I think that we kind of have that same attitude at times. I think we kind of look at church and say, well, you know, there's an hour that's kind of shot. You know, I don't know that I got much out of it today. Instead of saying, you know what? How did I connect with my heavenly father? Or we think that, that when we leave this place and, and there's an opportunity for us to share something about God and his kingdom and if we would just sit down and talk with someone, maybe something really cool could happen and we get at the end of that and think, man, that was just wasted. But maybe those opportunities that we take have an eternal impact that we don't know anything about right now. And maybe it's the most incredible day in someone's life as they take that next huge step closer to God. You know, at this church, I don't, I don't know where you are. I don't know wh where you stand in your walk with God. For some of you, you've heard a lot about Jesus, but you've never made that step and saying, you know what, I want a relationship with him. And if you're one of those people, we have some people that would love to share with you from the Bible how you can begin that relationship with Jesus Christ today. And so in a minute, we'll give you a chance to respond. Uh, for those of you that have already accepted Christ, uh, the, the question is, what are you doing about it? As a part of a real church, as we study about the book of Acts and what the people did, I mean, people, they didn't have to know everything there was to know about God or about the Bible 
They said, man, what do I need to do now? And so you need to figure out what that next step is for you. But for every one of us, I would just ask that you stand up where you are right now. If you need to talk to someone about beginning a relationship with God or you need someone to pray with you, why don't you come meet me up front as we sing this song?